All right, just about ready to head over to the canvas here and get sketching, figuring out our values and our design. All right, pretty cool. So I just printed it up with the lines and it actually has the ruler on it. So I can kind of see, and that's not very easy to see in the camera there, but that'll give me a quick little idea of my placement. So I'll grab my handy little um, T square here and put a couple marks on there really quickly that will allow me into the painting really quickly, just putting out. So my gray that I've been using again is just leftover paint. I just keep throwing it in this container and giving it a little mix. So I get a little slightly different gray each time. Um, and I could always modify that with a little bit of white or black if it was, you know, wanted it one way or the other, but this is a kind of a nice mid value gray and it's slightly warmish. It's not as cool. It seems like maybe a little bit of pink or red slipped in there at some point, which is fine because this will all be covered with oil paint eventually. Let's squeeze out a little bit of white paint. And again, I'm just using my little disposable plate. I don't know why I do that always with my acrylics, but sure makes cleanup easy. And this is in fact the same plate that I used for the last one. I just uh, scribbled or uh, blended the paint out and I made the plate nice and gray and nice mid-tone. So that's kind of cool. And now very quickly, I'm just going to look at my reference and get a couple of these marks down there. So again, the corner of my trail is going to be my main point right up here. So that's going to be where everything is reliant on that. It's kind of the most important point on my painting. So I'm going to measure seven inches down. If I get a little paint on the brush instead. Seven inches down. And it is approximately eight and a half inches across is where that point is. So right there, nice important mark. You guys can see that little black dot there or gray dot. Okay, this big tree is at three inches in there. I'm just gonna go ahead and put this line in there. Again, it's my not quite my horrors or not quite my um, horizon, but it's a very important line and it'll show me where do things kind of go above it or below it. Um, at 13 inches down is where the bottom of the big dark mass is. It comes into six inches, right about there. So my big dark mass is there. And 13 inches is also the base of these tree, this bunch of trees over here. And they roughly kind of come into the 13 inch mark again. So these trees here basically do that. And acrylics are just so great because everything can be so quickly kind of knocked in with the uh, knowledge that I will be able to come back in and cover and make, hopefully make these make sense. So they're kind of just placeholders. Any questions on that, you guys? This is kind of the edge of the, where things start to get crazy in this area. I'm just gonna, as a reminder, kind of put a little line up here 
we're raising up the canopy so it's a little more light, a little more space for light in here. Hey, Michael, yes. have you ever used a proportional divider for this? I don't do that. Um, I, I bought one online and it's so crappy. It won't hold it. It won't stay in the same ratio, you know, uh, um, but it seemed like it would be an interesting thing. I've never actually <laughs> successfully used it. Right, and I've seen videos where artists are using them, especially if they're doing the site size formula and different things like that. Um, but no, I just don't really, I don't really do all that. Again, it's usually kind of a jumping off point. I just need just a bit of information to kind of help me dive in. It, again, it, it's that whole theory of go slow to go fast. So by giving myself a couple notes, um, I'm hoping that I'll be able to attack it a little bit better. So this is the, the bottom of the right side of the trail. And this point is kind of the top of the trail. So I'm going to draw it in very cartoony just to start with, just so we can really kind of see what's going on. Did we ever come up with a good idea for this tree right at the top? Were we going to lean that in a little bit? As opposed to out? I think a branch will do it. So I'll just give it a touch of a lean. A little more lean out here. I'm sure this will is officially by far and away the most complicated thing I've ever tried to paint in front of the class or draw in front of the class. So congratulations, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I actually really like it that you that you're doing something this complicated. Yeah, thanks. I hope. Uh, hope. Yeah, it's <clears throat> very instructive already. Good. Like finding the horizon line, even though there isn't an obvious horizon, but just where the trail ends, that's a very good idea. Yeah, just really starting kind of big to small, maybe a couple points that are really 
important, but it's again, it's big shapes to small shapes, um, darks to lights. Thin to thick. And to thick eventually, yeah. Especially when I get to the oils. The good thing about the acrylics, you don't have to worry about that nearly as much because it dries so darn fast. Yeah, I'm just looking for kind of abstract shapes that are helping tell that story or give me the big underlying abstract, well, yeah, giving me the big abstract form of lights and darks. Um, Do you know the date of the next class when it begins? It is on my website. I don't know it offhand. They're not accepting signups yet. Um, yeah, I have a bunch of classes that are kind of in between right now. Um, or they're, I've got them on the website so you can kind of mark your calendar, but you're not able to sign up yet. It's always nice when I make a guess and then find out my measurements were not too far off. Are those little horizontal lines next to the one um, um, is that just to remind you sort of, a, or to help lay down the path? The ones down by the first little pointy ray of light that you just put in. Those little down, down, those little horizontal lines next to the- Oh, that's right just shadow. Okay. As opposed to coming in and filling all that in. Again, it's all get covered. I'm just trying to say where is light, where is shadow? Very graphic at this point. This is an interesting shadow because it actually turns, which gives me the feeling that there's a little bit of a, the hill rises up a little bit on the other side. Kind of nice little useful. striped path. But yeah, really all these notes, you know, as many or as little as you need. I find that if I do too many notes, meaning I start drawing with detail, I become scared to hurt my drawing. So I don't want too much, but I want enough that I'm confident about my marks as I put them in. Does that make sense? I 
it's much easier to fix now and with placement being really important at this stage. Yeah, and at least with acrylic, you don't have to worry about making a big muddy mess while you adjust things. Right. Okay. Get in a couple flat leftover fine marks here. And then I will get back to a bigger brush so we can actually cover some area a little faster. mess in here. Comes across to where the shadows are. It's that shadow. Sorry, a little quiet here for a minute. Talk amongst yourselves if you like, um, just while I'm kind of concentrating on placement. And I'm still just trying to figure out the big, big shapes. So this, it's all I'm like looking at that and thinking about the eventual ferns that will go in and was wondering if you leave like light spots for them or you're just gonna paint over with um, the, the paint. I truly could do it either way. Um, and, um, yeah, I'll probably do a combination of a little bit of both, leaving a little bit of the texture, but no, I would rather kind of get in my big masses. I think that's going to be more important. And especially because I can come back in with acrylic, I can just come back in with the gray right on top, um, after I get my big shapes established. All right, I'm going to switch over to a slightly bigger brush and let's get covering. Again, with the knowledge that um, acrylics get darker when they dry and then they'll get darker yet when I um, come in with a glaze color which I think this painting is going to have to be done pretty opaquely. I don't think I'll do such a refined drawing that, um, that I'll be able to just, uh, you know, just do glazing. Plus, I'm not sure if I even still like the idea of just glazing, like if I like the look for me. Um, I kind of would like to work on building up my paint to uh, thicker parts, thicker... Um, application more opaque in areas so so I was thinking about the problem of glazing over black and white acrylic crowd clouds mm -hmm. and if you try and get any kind of yellowy tint in there the way clouds are you get green and also, I'm noticing that you have a gray-toned canvas here. Yeah. So what if, what if, what if, 
what if when you're laying out a painting, you take a sponge with white on it and go in and just walk in the whole sky, just background. So the gray tone is for the land and the white is for the sky. And then as you make your black and white, under, your value underpainting, instead of using grays to block in the clouds, you use maybe a reddish tint or um, you know something that is not going to turn green with yellow. Yeah. I'm just... Yeah, I remember... I mean, it, um... Maxfield Parish was using blue. Um, well, that would totally the, turn it rocks. I don't, yeah. I mean, a lot of times I don't even really block in my clouds because they're so, I, you know, I can just use them so responsively, meaning put them in the way that the painting might need. Um, you don't, you can just paint your sky. Actually, I was kind of noticing that too, that even when you do block in clouds, by the time you get your, you know, you're painting your trees and your land and all that, your clouds have to have a different gesture to balance out the composition. Right. So all the work you went to with the acrylic is kind of <laughs> unnecessary. Right. Yeah, I do find myself going back in and whitening, lightening the sky up so often um, that I'm not... I'm curious to see how you're going to handle all that viney area because I never have a clue how to handle that. The big mess yeah. in here. Yeah. Well, you know what I want to see. Go ahead. I want to see how you paint the ferns because, man, I can never get ferns. Squinting my eye for sure, just looking for what are the what are the basic basic shapes that I can use to. tell the story of the ferns will be the most useful. Um, and just like, um, you can just tell the story of a couple of the ferns up front, and then you can start putting in more directional brushwork. And your eye will just, the viewer's eye just instantly goes, well, those are also ferns. So I don't, probably won't over describe too many of them. Uh, so just a hint of a fern. Yeah. And right. Huh. With all these little marks, I'm already having a hard time remembering what did that mark mean? <laughs> uh, that was the bottom of the trail, or kind of the pronounced trail. It's a well-trodden enough park that A lot of the areas on the trail go beyond the little boards. Lots of little school field trips and stuff go there.
And again, I'm just still just kind of going, what's important here? What, what information do I need to know? Because again, I, I, I can finish this as much or as little as I want in acrylic and I could do you know, as much glazing or as little glazing, or this could simply be, I could very quickly just start painting op uh, opaque. Nice dense acrylics right over the top. Right away. And the trails, the, the um, shadows as they go back do appear to get a little lighter. So it's interesting to hear, Laura, how you worked and how you kind of built up. Um, and you can see I don't really do it the same way with my acrylics. As I'm just not, I, I try not to think really back, forward, all that stuff yet. Um, I did really enjoy it and I think it works really well for you. But I'm still just thinking big shapes, slightly smaller shapes directional line, super important for me to get shapes first. Yeah, and the, and the trick I was using is definitely a gimmick. It's very hard to do that from a, like a photo reference or a real, um, when you're out in plein air because you can't actually see those layers. Yeah, good point. Yeah, that is that. That's an interesting conundrum for it. And again, I'm just trying to see wh where do my shadows connect? Where do they break apart? Where do the light areas connect? And the cool thing is like, yeah, you can see I just go right over the top of areas because it's so easy for me to bring them right back in. With the light coming from back there, do you will you want a little light on each side of the trunks there? 
yeah, you, you good, good observation. Yeah, it'll be a little more on the right side because it's coming, but it'll wrap around if that's what you're talking about on these trees that I'm just about to knock in. I'm going to have to leave, Michael, and watch the rest of this when you put it, uh, you know, online. So All thank right. you. Well, I'm glad you're able to make it, and uh, I'm sure that was nice being able to take your grandchild to school. It's always fun to have that little bit of time when they're prisoners in the car, they have to talk to you. It's nice. <laughs> That's for sure. I okay. Miss, I miss my driving my daughter around. Okay. Well, thank All right, I, I kind of, I mean, I need to step back here in a second, but I, I do feel like things are kind of beginning to happen. It's a chaotic mess. I mean, it really, really is. It, it makes my brain hurt and talking and doing all this at the same time. It's like putting together a thousand piece puzzle while having a job interview or something, I don't know. Um, but I don't know. I don't know why people bother to watch the Olympics when they be, can be watching you paint. Well, I'm sorry, I totally missed what you said. I said, I don't know why people bother watching the Olympics when they could be watching you paint. Yeah, totally. <laughs> we literally love watching paint dry. Yeah, well. <laughs> Acrylics are like literally, <laughs> literally. <laughs> the oil paints where they become excruciating. Looks like you've That's got the basic. Looks like you've got a great start, Michael. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's. I feel like it's kind of coming along. Um, now I get to do the fun part. What? Uh, Michael, excuse me. Please. Uh, and everybody, I'm going to leave early too because I don't feel well. I think I'm, I don't know if I'm getting the COVID, but I don't feel very good. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you. Okay. Get better. Get better soon. <laughs> okay. okay. I'll have it posted hopefully um, this afternoon. And um, you're going to miss the fun part, though. This is where I get to put the brights on. Okay. I'll, I'll try to hang in there. <laughs> God bless you, Denise. Yeah, take oh, care. yeah, thank you. I was just going right. to lay down and rest. So I'm just coming on. So these brights that you're putting on are acrylic and yeah, it's all acrylic. And you put a little yellow in there? No. Oh, okay. This looks it's like it from my side. Gray is so bluish feeling. So cool. Yeah. Well, welcome back. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I love the white when you get to add in the highlights. It really starts to bring things to life. And it's still not a one-way track, right? I can 
put in these lights and I can come back in with some gray texturing on top or whatever else. So again, it's just the big shapes to the little shapes. And uh, but once I get that third value or fourth value in, I do believe that it starts to uh, feel like something. This means something. We got these nice reflective ferns, waxy leaf. So they're really picking up some of that reflective highlight or reflecting some of that light in there as well. Plus I wanna tell us about that light coming through that's hitting down below. I'm just looking, I'm not gonna put the fronds in as so much as just some directional reflections. And hopefully that will feel a bit like just by putting kind of the right shapes in. Might convey somehow magically the feeling of ferns. Right now, I would be using the tiniest of brushes for those ferns, but it looks like you're using a medium-sized brush. Do you think that's yeah, better? Got globs of paint on it. I can't. I don't know if you can see that or not, but yeah, I'm just. And it's this is a flat, which I never. I mean, not a flat, but a short, which I never use. This is one of. I can tell by the yellow handle. This is actually one of my old college brushes. I had yellow handles for some reason. I don't know why, where I bought them or what, but. Um, I, I just don't really throw away my brushes hardly ever and you know thank goodness I have this big bucket of old crazy brushes for now that I'm getting back into painting with acrylics so I don't want my oil brushes to get acrylics on them. <laughs> So um, again, the homework is I would like you to kind of get it to this stage. If, you're, if you want to do it with a black and white underpainting. Um, my, my goal would be that you get your references, you figure out what is the feeling? What is the story? Why did I pick this? What do I want to convey? Right? And then I want you to do your editing, those thumbnail sketches like we just did, or I did it on the computer so I could show it to you better. But um, the uh, whatever it takes to make sure you've got your ideas worked out, just like we did, we just kind of ask questions of all the different elements in that reference or in that drawing or whatever it is. Is this useful? Does this help tell that story? Is this, um, can I change angles? Can I, you know, edit, edit, edit? If it's not helping, it's oftentimes hurting your image. Really hard for a lot of people to remember that is, it's not often or not usually aided in our paintings by adding more. It's usually how much can I take out? 
to help tell the story more. We all know the experience, and maybe you're having it right now, of somebody who just tells the stories really too long, too much unnecessary detail. Um, and, you know, just get to the point, right? So yeah, I one, have, go ahead. When, uh, one of the things that when, when I'm looking over your, um, uh, your, your, your questions is that they, they make your, they make a painting seem so epic. And I was like, I'm not telling a story. I'm just trying to make a tree look like a tree. <laughs> yeah. And story is not always the rest ter best terminology for it, for sure. And, and yeah. also when you, when you, you know, when you're working on a small painting, I, I just feel like, but this, it's just, it's just a sketch. So let's, uh, let's not get all, you know, it just seems too heavy to, yeah, I, I don't want to bog you down by any means, but for our final assignment, I want to push you. I want to challenge you that little bit more. Um, yeah. Story, let's, if, if story seems too daunting, then maybe not story, maybe just what is it that drew me to this and how do I convey, how do I share that thing that drew me in? Right. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying those questions are bad. I love the questions and I love thinking about it. I just feel, uh, I don't know, un, un, unequal to the task. Okay, if you had, um, and, and I do have a photo like this, that I really like it because of the mood and the soft feeling and the sense of poetry it has, but it doesn't really have much contrast. It's kind of mostly one value. Would you discard it because of that? Would you push the values and make them up? Or Can I ask you a question about it? Yeah. Is it the fact that it's very muted and one value part of what drew, draws you to it? Or is it the subject that draws you to it? It's the soft, the softness and the tranquility. Well, then it sounds like that's what you're going to try to work on conveying. Okay. Yeah, no, there, you, def, you definitely, strong contrast has its place, but also so does very calm subtlety. Sounds like a tonalist painting. Right. Well, it, it's actually, it's, it's a little bit similar to your other woodland painting you didn't, didn't do today, except that it's early spring and it's not in the shadows, but it's a very soft pastel-y light. And the water is powdery blue and the trees are spring pastel-y green and there's just Sounds like a high value key, right, Michael? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's definitely a high key. So no, then it becomes about that thing. So that's what you, when you're asking those questions and you're writing those notes, I, I very much strongly suggest that um, you, before you begin, read this, Michael's painting protocol, <laughs> Michael's <laughs> Warwick steps to building a successful foundation of painting. And then I suggest I printed out a whole bunch of these for myself because this is my new until it becomes second nature, until I stop messing up and wasting entire weeks on bad paintings, I'm going to do this. And it's it's going to help. I know it. Again, go slow to go fast. It, it feels like, oh my God, Mike, I don't want to do 10 minutes of work. I just want to paint. But let's just fill this out. When you're looking at the references, fill this out. Halfway through your painting, fill it out again. And at the end of your painting, fill it out again. Check your answers. Did they stay the same? If they changed, was it purposeful or for the better? You could make an app for that. <laughs> yeah, that would be <laughs> The Michael Orwick's painting protocol. Yeah, it would be cool because you could link it to like 
the Notanizer app, or, you know, you could have right. at this step, you're doing this, you're bringing in your photos from your iPhone or whatever. And then this stage, you're looking at it on the Notanizer, maybe running it through Procreate or something, Photoshop or whatever, anything you're using, or just sketching anywhere, however you're choosing to do your sketching. Um, yeah, so I'm to only step, basically, I guess I'm to step four. I've done collect, gathering references. I've done plan, the sketch and the thumbnails, right? And that's what we were looking at on Photoshop. And we were all seeing which, if I could change it in any way, make it more interesting by doing other things, by editing it. Um, test, the small scale painting. Um, so that's the one thing I didn't do. And I'll probably do that before I go into the color on this. While this is drying, I'll probably go and turn this into an abstract with color different color choices and things like that to see uh, what works. Yeah, and that's what, and then start the painting, which is, um, so right now it's start the painting, properly prepare the desired surface and let it dry, begin the underlying value plan and structure, which is where I'm at. Establish light and shadow families. This is the foundation of the painting and the most important part, note, to self. <laughs> Again, I'm just like you, and we're all just a bunch of puppies. We're all a bunch of just little kids, right? It's come on, come on, come on. Let's get to the good part. Let's eat the cake frosting first. <laughs> we all want to get to color and fun brush strokes and everything else, but I, 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 I urge you to find the joy in this stage. I urge you to find uh, the enjoyment in design. It doesn't always come really readily, but also just know that you're going to earn the other parts. Your, the other parts will be that much more fun when I'm not also having to use my analytical side of my brain, right? If I get this laid in really beautifully, and then I pre-mix my beautiful colors, you know, they don't have to match my reference, but I get pre-mixed colors that I really like, then I'm off. Then I get to be doubly creative because I'm not bouncing back between the two hemispheres of my brain, if that's a real thing, the right and left side of the brain. I am in it. I'm opened it up. I'm allowing myself hopefully to get into the zone where my paintings can become more reactionary. And I just kind of flying along hopefully i know that our odds are increased of that happening if we slow down and do a little bit of the preliminary work you need to do a series of books of children's books. Don't be like Mike. Take your time, kids. Make plans. Observe. What kind of books would I should I make, Michelle? Well, like you talked about uh, the book that you just got, um, the workbook or the land, just instructional. Ah. Thank you. Um, so who was it that was talking about using the same foundations with their kid? Was that, was that Karen? Was that you? The, the Michael Orwick foundations of painting, the same could apply to uh, jujitsu lessons. Yes. Actually, we've yes. had some good conversations about that in the oh, past yeah. few weeks. Yeah. Kids aren't like, I don't know who this Mike guy is, but I hate him. <laughs> Like, seriously, even just instructing a 10 year old boy, which is the squirreliest thing on the planet, and just yeah, having him like, I promise you, washing dishes will be easier if you rinse them and stack them, organize them into hand wash and dishwasher. <laughs> Plan, <laughs> observe. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, yeah, my daughter um, has decided that she wants to. She loves vintage stuff and like old clothes and all that, but she's also got some old um, 
furniture. Some of it's really quite elegant, but you know, some of it she found discarded along the road and some grandma gave her, but they all need to be refinished and whatnot or painted at least, right? And uh, yeah, trying to convince her to actually strip the varnish before she just starts painting or sanding, you know, the different steps. Um, right. And rem remind her to re-glue the legs first before she does the finishing. I made that mistake. I'm sorry, what was that? Re-glue the legs. I had, I had some chairs and I refinished them, but they were a bit wobbly and they only got more and more wobbly. And I thought, wow, when I had them all stripped down, I should have just yanked them apart, put glue in the joints, clamped them back up. But now it's too late because all the finish is on. Yeah, no, that's good. I actually hadn't thought of that, so that's great. I had a nephew who was taking a wood shop class who um, took this antique piece that I wanted to have stripped and he, he disassembled the whole thing, sanded down all the legs and, and the door on all four sides so that when, when he put it back together, of course, it didn't even fit anymore and completely ruined it. Oh no. Oh, oh no. Hopefully it wasn't too valuable of a piece to you. Well, it's gone. So, you know, you, you got to let things go. Yeah, I mean, that's a big part of it is like all the pieces that my daughter has besides one, I think are, you know, feel free to learn that you're only going to help them. You're not. Um, but there is one kind of nice one that um, she I finally she finally went out and got paint uh, varnish stripper. But she decided to do it in the middle of summer when it was so hot that she just kind of, it gave up because it just kept drying so quickly. So it's very strange and globby right now. Anyways, right now I'm kind of getting fussy already. It's getting into uh, doing unnecessary detail work, um, but it sure is fun. As I kind of start to zoom in, into like the shadows and into the other underlying structures um, of what- It's very, it's very three-dimensional. Mm -hmm. Yeah, by leaving in these all lighter back here and having the darks coming, yeah. probably even um, push that a little bit by just knocking back these darks as well. Looks like the snow when it's starting to melt. Yeah, it does. Yeah, where things start to peek through it a little bit. And... Yeah. Yeah, and I could get, you know, I'm, I could already start bringing in some of the fun little highlights on the edge of trees and different things like that. I can get as um, detailed as I want, but it, I, just like everything else, it's kind of like stay in this stage of making big marks um, as long as possible. Um, and don't start getting fussy because what happens as soon as you start getting fussy is you start protecting things. And right now I'm still in this stage where I can just knock things in, knock them back out. I can just keep testing constantly. Um, everything. Um, so as soon as I start bringing in and putting in, trying to put in, you know, detail fronds or whatever, you know, little leaves in here, whatever it is, I've got to be, um, make sure I'm ready for that because it just slows everything down and things become more precious. It's really important that I keep things not precious for as long as possible. Um, I just don't want to be protecting things. I want to be able to make big, bold, brash decisions as they're needed without much hesitancy. Do you think you'll start with glazing or just go right to impasto? I think I'll glaze it um, probably earth red. So I think that's kind of the underlying tie-in color, you know, with the dirt, with the warm leaves, with the tr tree trunks. I think that that color, if I just wanted to be kind of not do too much with my um, glazing, I think that that would just be a nice 
you know, if I was going to paint this onto a toned surface, I think that that's the color I would probably choose. Um, so I can just think, kind of think of it like that. You know, if, if there's any spots of it showing through, what would be the best color that I could have showing through? Um, I am really having a great time doing this. This, it's, reminds me of that whole, uh, you know, everything's scary until you just do it. Um, you know, the chasm is not as wide as you think, just jump. Um, but I really appreciated having that time today to talk about it with you guys and to um, kind of walk my way through mentally and verbally, I guess, of how I could approach this super daunting, highly complicated image. You know, how does somebody step up and do something like that? I don't know, but now I do. And now you do too, if you like what you saw and you think that this is useful. Yeah. It's just great watching you do this and go through the process. Good, I'm so glad. Thank you. Um, yeah, I every I, I, I'm sure I've said this a, a number of times, but every time I come, at kind of you know, I'm thinking about the next class. Basically, the second this class ends, I'll start thinking about the next class, and every time I kind of come up with a rough idea and then every night before class or when I'm sending you guys out that little email, I'm like, Oh my gosh, what do you think? You can't do all that. Or, you know, what crazy teacher is going to paint something this complicated, something I wasn't willing to even approach or I was scared to approach on my own in the safety of my own studio by myself. Why would I do that in front of a group? But, you know, here we are. Well, you know, I I play folk music for folk dancers and oh, yeah? often in, in performance settings. And um, they say, you know, the one way to master, master a tune is to have to play it in front of an audience. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's interesting and it's, interesting how often I get invited to do it more and more and more and you know what's the biggest fear ha people have right is talking and performing in front of people um what is it uh I remember some some comedian had a good quote about that 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 he had to give a speech at a funeral and he brought that up and he's like you know the biggest fear even more than death is the fear of talking and performing in front of people. And he's like, who would have thought that guy was the lucky one? And he points to the guy in the castle. <laughs> well, that just reminds me of uh, uh, some lectures I was listening to from Dr. David Eagleman, who's a neuroscientist. He studies how the brain works. Uh -huh. And he was very interested in studying how your brain sequences uh, uh, sensory stimuli. Like if something touches your foot, how long does it take to get to your brain? Ah. So he's done a ton of research on this. And, and in conclusion, he says, um, the way your brain works is the things you feel don't actually hit your brain until a certain amount of processing has taken effect. So for instance, if somebody shoots you in the head, you won't feel it. That's the good news. Huh. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you do hear about people <laughs> with um, massive- Oh, come on, get it? That's the good news. The bad news is you're dead. <laughs> oh, that, okay, yeah. Is that, I was actually first on a car accident where I ended up holding this guy's brains into his head for a long time I was way out in the wilderness Jesus Christ yeah it was crazy and he would keep coming to every once in a while and yell at me that I was whole pulling his hair 
And I would just tell him to go back to sleep. And wow. he would. Yeah, he would start like punching at me and stuff. And it was really weird because I was only a senior in high school. So I don't even know how I had the kind of idea just to tell him to go back to sleep. But wow, did he that survive? Is a dramatic story. Yeah, he survived. Wow. And so I did you. A couple of years later at a party, I, I, went, I went to introduce myself, but he did not want to talk to me at all. He didn't want to have anything to do with that. So. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah, a girl told me, she's like, oh, that guy's here. So I was like, oh, can you introduce me? And she went and asked him, thank goodness, first. And he said, no. But I still well, watched him. Make sure. Maybe when he gets older, he'll have a different perspective. I don't know. That was 20 years ago now. But I mean, I'm sure he has zero, zero memory of the whole thing and probably had to go through all the pain of recovery and all that I'm sure you know I, I don't think I probably even well I don't even know if he knows I exist like you know what I mean I don't know if the paramedics when they finally showed up because that was back before cell phones or they were just just coming out and they had such bad range so the other guy that was with me had to go drive in like 10 miles to find somebody that had a cell phone and would actually trusted him and would let him use it and, and so were you part of the party that was involved in the accident or were you just driving along no driving? it was so strange um we were actually on our way to find a party because i grew up you know a redneck or whatever not really but i grew up in the country so our parties were always out in the woods or rock quarries or by some creek um so we we're going out to a place we didn't really know beyond where we'd ever been to find this party and finally just gave up like it can't be on this road because you know you go up there in the hills and they're not really even marked and we were driving back around this big bend way 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 up on the top of this dirt road hill and uh standing in the middle of the road covered in blood is this I think 13 year old girl just standing there and uh you know we were so in shock by seeing this. We didn't know what was going on. So we, you know, of course stopped and she runs up to the car or whatever, ambles up to the car and is like, help me, I've killed my brother. And it was so, Jesus. yeah, she was just totally in shock. And she just kept saying that I killed my brother, I've killed my brother. And we get her into the back of the car and we go around the turn one more time. And so if you imagine it's a steep hill then the road, and then another steep hill. And on the bottom of this hill is a, the meandering creek. And on the bottom hill, so the creek, and then in the hill, that whole hillside is on fire. <gasps> oh my God. They're not all on fire, but it, there's a lot of fire going on. And even on the road, there's fire, like gasoline had gotten onto the road. Oh and, my God. Um, that really freaks her out when she sees this. And um, yeah, I jump out of the car and I realize that there's a great big old truck had gone off the edge and there's a big boulder on the front of it and it smashed into that and was caught on fire. And um, I couldn't see anybody um, at all. She just kept saying that she killed her brother. So we knew there was a campsite about a mile down the road. So we took her down to that and convinced, because we didn't know anybody there, convinced somebody to help her take care of her and then my buddy took me back up and I jumped out of the car and realized on that boulder was a guy so right in the very front of that car on fire truck on fire was a guy laying on top of the boulder with blood all over the boulder so I jumped down off this cliff and where I landed there was a kid covered in dirt just laying there and I thought he was dead because he didn't move and then I ran over to the boulder. That guy was moving a little bit, but then I, when I reached down to help him, that's when I could feel his brains on the back of his head. And uh, the girl, somehow we learned that there was actually three people, including her in the truck and the little girl had been driving. And there was one in the cabin with her and two in the back of the cat, whatever, of the bed. And uh, 
Yeah, that's, and so I, I never did find the third person. I, I was scared that they were just burning up in the truck. And I was really scared that the truck was going to explode because I was right beside it, but it never did, thank goodness. And the uh, uh. boy that was laying there eventually got up and just wandered off into the woods and they found him a while later. Um, he was uh, he was concussed and so he didn't know what was going on. And then the guy who was on the rock was one of the two guys in the back. So the kid and the guy in the, on the rock. So but they found the other guy the next morning. He was also just wandering around in the woods. So I don't know if they were just had weird concussions or if he'd gone to get help and got lost. I, I never heard, figured that story out. Uh, How old were you at this time when this happened? It was my senior year of high school. Jesus, what a traumatic thing to happen to a high schooler. It was pretty interesting. Yeah, I remember coming home really late that night and waking my parents up. And I'm like, I have to tell you something. So how many people total were involved in the accident? Four. They had just driven off. They decided it would be funny to let this little 13-year-old girl drive up on this very slim, dirt country road with a cliff beside it is my understanding but i think they were all young they may have well stolen the car or borrowed the car i should say and and where in the ozarks was this yeah no kidding well have you ever heard of sweet home oregon you know i have heard of sweet home it's kind of the ozarks of oregon I, I, i've heard funny things about it but then yeah, I grew up in. Who am I to say? I grew up in Sodaville, which is a town of a hundred people, even smaller than Sweet Home. Um, Sounds like it should be a TV show. Yeah, there's definitely elements. It's funny we had our uh, yearly get together between me and four of my buddies I graduated with, and uh, I had invited some friends from college to stop in, and um, yeah, we were doing our yearly storytelling time to each other. You know, do you remember? Do you remember? Mm -hmm. and uh yeah i was like the guy even like grew up on the coast of california like uh santa cruz and he's like you guys have so many stories and <laughs> i was like yeah, i guess it's really weird when you try to just entertain yourselves um but most of our stories were about our crazy friends i wasn't that crazy Okay, I think I'm going to leave it there, let it kind of tack up. But I mean, that kind of looks like something a little bit. That's kind of nice. Okay. Um, and I think, you know, no matter what, it's, it's approachable um, for me. So step oh, one was to make it approachable to get to the canvas. So by doing the really simple, you know, no tan, right? Yeah. I guess that's not the no tan. Here's the no tan. Again, when I saw this, I was like, oh, no, that's hideous. This looks like a giant hand or something. Um, but then I remembered again that there's so much information in here that I'll be able to do. Like, Because you can imagine this is kind of this uh, bluey, beautiful green on top with kind of warmer but dark browns underneath setting that off. And then with the lime greens or lighter, lighter uh, greens on top, I think... I can bring so much beauty into this. And I can also use some fallen leaves to add other little hints of color. So in these shadows, even though in, that's why no tans don't always work, right? Because that is, that's hideous. And I don't well, even know what up. Yeah, computer generated no tans don't work. Yes, but if exactly you were in the right. old school, you know, you did that with ink or pencil or something, you could put yeah. that in. Yeah, exactly. And that's why I did that one digitally that we looked at earlier and like, okay, right. in here is a lot of information. And then the grayscale. Three, three yeah, actually that, three that digital. But still the shadows are massively dark. Um, so it takes all these things. It takes all these references to remember that, oh, there's so much pretty things going on in these shadows. And I can play them up. I can really even liven them up more than in the photos. Um, anyways, phew, that was a lot of talking. You got me storytelling. Man, I am my mother. My mom, <laughs> my mom was the English teacher in high school and so many people would be like, your mom's my favorite teacher. And I'm like, oh, that's awesome. That's so cool. And they're like, yeah, all she had to do is get her to start talking and she'd start telling a story and she'd forget to do anything else, so. <laughs> 
Um, anyways, there. Uh, let me put it a little more straightforward. That's kind of a pretty crazy angle. Um, so the homework is to at least get it onto the canvas. It doesn't need to be finished, but I want you to kind of get it to this stage. So I realize that that's a lot. That's a lot to ask to go through all these different stages. And it's going to take some time because it's our first time doing it for some of us. But I promise you, if you do it and then do it somewhat consistently, a lot of it will become more second nature. You don't even have to always do all the steps, but it will be in there. It'll be in your brain. It'll be in your data banks. That looks better sideways, sorry forward looks crazy um and yeah it's just a great way to train your brain to begin to think about elements of painting and approaching a painting so for some of you you'll probably never do value studies after you you know graduate with straight a's from my class um and for others of you you'll really carry this on and do lots um and you know make it a part of your toolbox so anyways, I appreciate you guys very much. Thank you for, uh, for those of you that could stick around. And I, I understand completely um, those that couldn't. And I look forward to seeing what you choose. If you want to share the different stages as you're working onto the website, again, I will try to get on there and give feedback. But please give feedback and information to each other. And um, Laura, you are so good about it. Do you mind sharing the homework Oh, yes. Okay. One more time um, on the Facebook. I, page. I did write a few notes down. I will, I will cool, put cool, those up. Cool. Okay. All right. You guys are awesome. Right. Have a good Thank one. Thank you, Michael. Enjoy lunch. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye.